So welcome back everyone. I hope you've been enjoying your day so far. Next up, we have a really important discussion for you titled the role of product design in successful med tech commercialization. So with that, I'm delighted to hand you over to, to, to your moderator for the session, Catherine Longworth from Pharma Forum, who's going to introduce the session and invite the panelists to introduce themselves as well. So Catherine, over to you. Great, thank you, Angela. And th thank you everyone for joining us today for this um, exciting panel session. Um, we've got some great speakers and we're looking forward to a good discussion. So design has become a priority at the highest levels of MedTech um, in recent years. And as we know, connectivity, patient centricity and digitalization um, are having greater influence on the success of devices and diagnostics, implantables and devices and much more. Um, so looking, taking a forward looking approach to MedTech design, innovators can sort of ensure that regulatory and compliance success um, takes place, but also that payers, providers and patients are getting the best outcomes. So we're going to talk a bit today about the key considerations that medtech entrepreneurs and commercial leaders should prioritize um, and uh, their success in the long run. So welcome everyone um, and uh, just turn it over to the speakers if you could all introduce yourselves and tell us all about you. Um, over to you first, Steve. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Steve Swinson calling from Switzerland. Um, I've been in healthcare for a good 30 years worked for the large companies, HP Medical Systems, GE and Medtronic in senior leadership positions. The last uh, six or seven years, I've been involved in startups and SMEs. I chaired five companies, led three to an exit strategy. Currently, I'm chairman of two companies, Comfia and OPFL uh, spin-off, and Tobia Holdings, which is one of the largest healthcare companies in Saudi Arabia. And I move over to Claire. Thank you. Uh, I'm Claire, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Lightpoint Medical. Uh, I've been in healthcare about 15 years, been with Lightpoint for five. Uh, Lightpoint is a small, fairly early stage company based in the UK. Um, we have just launched the world's first robotic gamma probe, which is intended to uh, assist surgeons find cancer at the point of operation uh, during prostate surgery. Uh, we got the CMAR mark three yesterday, so. Uh, we're all very excited. And I will turn over to Chaz. I'm Chaz Taylor. Um, I'm calling from the southernmost COVID zone in the UK, otherwise known as Sussex. Um, and I've been in the medtech business about 35 years. I have founded or co-founded um, three companies in the cardiovascular space, one in carotid intervention, um, one in venous intervention, IVC filters, and one was a spin out from Imperial College in London. Um, all of those companies have been sold to various corporate buyers, an English one, BTG, uh, Abbott Laboratories, and Otsuka Pharmaceuticals, a Japanese company. And I'm currently involved as chairman of a company called RMI, which is in the respiratory monitoring space, um, Oxford Endovascular, which is in neurovascular intervention. And I'm a director of a company in Ireland called Vasorum, which is involved in vessel closure. So I'm delighted to um, be part of this panel today and um, over to Frederick. Thank you, Chaz. So, hello everyone, and uh, hello from Switzerland as well, the same as Steve. Uh, my name is Frederick Stromberg, responsible for Novo Bicare North Europe uh, in a commercial role today. Uh, but I've been in the field of dental implantology the last 17 years, where I've had uh, many different uh, roles, uh, also within product management and uh, developing concept and, and launching concept within guided surgery and CAD CAM prosthetic solutions uh, and, and the likes as well. So same as Jess, very happy to be here today and uh, join in this discussion. Great, thank you everyone, thank you so much. So let's get started and um, to begin with, it'd be great, um, we'll start with you Chaz. Um, maybe you could set the scene for us a bit about how companies approach product design and all the different parts that they need to think about when um, at the very beginning of the journey. Sure, thanks, Catherine. So, you know, the design of the product is such a fundamentally important thing to, to the company and to its um, potential success. And so when the companies I've been involved in, when we think about it, we first think about what's the application for the product. Um, of course, that, that's really a given part of the business plan. What's the market size, et cetera. But then importantly, what's the unmet clinical need? Um, 
perhaps what's the competition doing, um, if there is competition, if you're not a first mover in the space, and what does our product need to do that others don't? What, what is going to be a unique um, selling feature um, for this product? Need to consider um, not just clinical outcomes anymore. Um, that's way behind us. We need to consider economic outcomes and how this product's going to be reimbursed, whether it's currently reimbursed or, um, or whether or not we can produce clinical evidence to allow it to be reimbursed in the future. There's a very interesting um, recent um, announcement from Avamed in the US um, with regard to the FDA breakthrough program. And it now looks like products that get um, awarded the breakthrough designation for FDA will get, um, under certain circumstances, up to four years of coverage, which replaces the old reimbursement new technology add-on payments, which is a huge deal. So if you can make your product differentiated enough, then it's a, it's a massive um, leg up. So when we think about design, we think about the parameters that we can work in. So first of all, is there intellectual property out there? Of course, you're never going to know everything out there. But are there things that we just can't do because other people have thought of it before? Uh, what kind of materials can we use? It's always easier to use known materials from a regulatory point of view, so we don't have to create files on unknown materials. Um, of course, we rely heavily on input from key opinion leaders and people that are experts in the space that are going to be using the product, and so they can provide um, design inputs. And the likely clinical and economic outcomes that are going to be required by the regulators and the reimbursement um, groups like CMS, etc. Um, and how our product design can affect those clinical outcomes that's going to make this product um, reimbursable or economically um, viable. So that's the first bit. And then I guess then it iterates as we go through. But that's how we've really approached the initial design phase. Um, Catherine. Excellent. Um, and you touched on sort of the reimbursement. I mean, how early should companies be already thinking about this piece of the puzzle? Um, Claire? Maybe you have some thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, well, you can't start early enough. Um, it, it's the simple answer. You know, without reimbursement, your product is not going to get wide scale adoption. You, as a small company, are not going to get um, a, a, any kind of acquisition. You need to make sure that you're thinking about it from day one. Um, We've found that the, the, the move towards user-centered design um, and engagement earlier has been brilliant for this because as we review the clinical pathway, as we work with our KOLs to understand how they want our product to work, we also take the opportunity to look at where the stakeholders are. Uh, we, you know, at which point in the process are we engaging with other departments? And, uh, and to put it simply, we follow the money. You know, where is the money going and where is the money being spent? Where can we add health economic value? As a small company trying to you know, fund the sorts of trials um, that you need for, for, for HTA, you know, the kind of, you know, the double RCTs, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, but as Charles rightly pointed out, there are so many programs out there and available for innovative companies that kind of give you a temporary reimbursement that allows you to get the evidence you need to go to go for full. So, um, yeah, early stage engagement for health and economics as well as user design, it's, it's, it's essential. And I think, Steve, you've had uh, plenty of expertise with, uh, with acquisitions, uh, strategic and otherwise. Would you agree? Yes, yes, uh, fully with, with both of you. The, the reimbursement uh, does drive even the funding to some of these SMEs. So if I'm an investor, and I want to invest in a series A, B, C, or D, I look at the company likely chance of getting reimbursed because this is what actually drives the return on investment. So what, what's happening now is larger companies, it's also influencing their decision on what products they, they come out with. I don't want this to make it uh, sound that innovation a new innovation concept completely does not have a, a payoff in the long run. It does, but it's a lot of hard work. And the design phase, I kid you not, is the most important phase in, a, in actually putting a product together. You may need a multidisciplinary team from engineering, from uh, IP, legal, from uh, business, from an advisory board, and so on. So it sounds like an impossible task, but it can be done in a structured manner. Many small companies do it. They get approval, they get acquired afterwards. But I think the way Chess kind of outlined it is actually the right way to, to think about it. Uh, it's becoming more complicated, more competitive, 
the regulatory pathway is not as easy as people think. You gotta do your homework and on top of it, you gotta have a story, an economic, uh, economic health story there. So you need to get reimbursed and this has to make sense in terms of product specifications and what it can do, you know, value add to patients, which I think is the right way to go forward. Uh, but it puts a lot of pressure on the small companies, that's clear. Yeah, I mean, coming from a small company, uh, small company myself, I can absolutely, uh, absolutely confirm that uh, the pressure is real. But um, we've also we've done it. You know, it, it is possible. Um, the, the massive usability studies that, that that are being run by the you know the, the big corporates, obviously you can't afford those. But there are ways to do it um, with user engagement, early stage, and it, it pays off. It really does. So. For us, we use our um, you know, formative usability studies as a way to do early engagement with key opinion leaders. Um, you know, we, we go out and talk to the leaders in the field. We want to engage them in our design. We ask them to be involved in our usability studies. It gives us exposure that as a small company, we probably wouldn't get at that stage were we not reaching out to these, reaching out to these co-ls and asking for their opinion and their input into the design. So, it, the, it's invaluable in the design itself. Uh, the health economic arguments start to make themselves the, the earlier you, you get involved. But let's not forget the commercial aspect. You know, getting yourself in front of the key opinion leaders, getting your product and your indication out there and known as early as possible, and letting them follow you through the design journey so that when you come to your formatives and when you actually, you know, we, we publish publishing the results of our formative clinical uh, usability studies. Um, people are interested. They want to know. They remember having spoken to you, you know, a few years ago. and want to know what you're doing now. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for it outside of just the, you know, just just the obvious, uh, which is that your your product is then designed the way the users want to use it. Well, Claire, a question from my side on that one. Sorry, how how do you select the right KOLs when you're working with them, right? Because in our industry, or the dental industry, it's a highly underpenetrated. And, and there is, has been a tendency in the past to very much work with the specialists while it's really being a treatment that's been broadened to more and more right now. And, and listening only to the specialists, they are, of course, very you know, expert in their fields, right? While the challenges of a, a general dentist that's going into implantology is very different. And they are struggling. They have different things that they need to know about and, and that you need to cater for. How, how do you address that to make sure that you get the right KOLs when you design a product? You know, it's such a good point. You're absolutely right. So obviously when we're looking for KOLs in our field, we know what our indication is. We look to see who's publishing on it, right? Who's doing trials, who's publishing, who's doing studies. Um, and we, these, are the, these are the opinion leaders in the field and these are the guys that we want to talk to. We want to get their input. And obviously, you know, for, for the purposes of our clinical trials, we want these guys on our ad board, et cetera, et cetera. But you're absolutely right. There's a very different uh, medical need or you know, a, a indication from the academic guys, the professors that are, that are operating less frequently and, and looking at the more you know, academically interesting, leading niche. But your general surgeon who has you know, a, a, a patient list he needs to meet um, and, and, and you know, obviously has, has different requirements. And actually, user, you know, doing your usability studies earlier and starting to talk with these guys earlier will bring that will bring that out of the woodwork, and then you know where your economic arguments lie. There's no point going after the niche academic area of interest that's going to get you good publications, it's going to get you a claim in the academic community, but isn't going to sell. It's not going to get you your health economic benefits, and your general surgeons are not going to be as interested. For us personally, what we find is we start with the big guys and then we work out. You know, we work, we speak to the other people in their centres. We speak to their, you know, their, their, their sort of second in commands. Uh, we, look, we speak to the guys who are operating more frequently and we get a mixture of opinions in. Very often what we'll find is our company, company sponsored trials that we need to run for approvals or for reimbursement. Uh, we will go after uh, the the more uh, you know, the more needed um, you know, medical gaps. So you know we'll we'll go for a different indication. But the IIS is when we let the investigators take the device, they can investigate the niche academic area that they're interested in. They can you know look for us. It would be the difference between um, looking at salvage um, uh, nodes versus the primary indication. So yeah. I think both are important, both are valuable. There's nothing more valuable than a great publication in a well-esteemed journal with a highly regarded academic. It's great publicity. 
but it's not necessarily the indication that's going to get you in health economic benefit and and, and it's always good to keep that in mind absolutely right let, let me let me add a comment here sorry Catherine, mm -hmm. on the startups and i'll pass it to Chaz. companies small companies uh and i i've actually met a few of them they have a good idea they got a proof of concept and there's they think that they're able to kind of get acquired and let the big companies handle the fda the regulatory pathway the reimbursement the uh the clinical evidence-based medicine and so on my experience folks is that the larger companies want you to already have the approval want you to already have some sales traction and I have not yet met a large company that says, okay, we'll buy the concept and you guys don't worry about it. We'll do all the work. That was my experience selling those three companies. Uh, I mean, I can pass, I mean, if you find one, let me know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Chaz can comment on this. Please. Sure. So first of all, I just want, thank you, um, Steve. I just wanted to comment on the KOL thing. Um, because I think you've got to be, be careful with KOLs. Some KOLs are KOLs because they're capable of performing amazing feats. And if you're, um, and they, have, they are either terribly dexterous or they have just this incredible clinical knowledge that they can overcome um, design um, issues with products because of their skill. But that's not who you're designing the product for. You're designing the product to be used by, um, by practicing physicians um, every day. And I always think it's very important. I always tell our engineering teams, wherever we can, you must use existing techniques because small companies do not have the capability to train people to do operations differently, to do interventional right. procedures differently. So if you can use the same entry points, the same sizes of devices, all those things, it's very important. And then Steve, to, to, to your point, I think that, I mean, you're absolutely right. And frustratingly, and it's had a massive impact on the availability of capital in this space and, you know, a lot of, Capital that used to be available for medtechs leaked over to biotech because of the different returns and stuff. Is we used to get acquired early. I mean, when we sold Mednova, which was the crotted intervention play to Abbott, we got acquired after 10 patients. And it was looking good, but of course, 10 patients is nowhere near enough to tell whether the product was successful. Yeah. Now, that product did finally go on to FDA approval, and it's now and has been the number one product in its space, I think, since it was launched. And so that was good for Abbott. But you're absolutely right. Now, companies used to want FDA approvals, whether it's a 510K or a PMA, um, but now they more and more and more, they want to see evidence of income. And that means that it brings you back to this reimbursement question. If you can't get the thing reimbursed, then you're going to find it extremely difficult to build um, an income stream. Um, a great example of a company though, that did achieve it recently was Shockwave Medical that had a lithotripsy device that smashes calcium in vessels and they actually managed to get um, that whole concept reimbursed by um, CMS recently which was a huge upside for them and drove their valuation um, heavily but I completely agree with you stuff gets acquired a lot later now and you have to I always say you have to fund these companies um, to market as if they're going to be a going concern rather than just funding them to acquisition yeah, yeah. I mean we, when we and uh, in our fundraising, not, not just for acquisition, even for VC, even quite a small VC round, it's no good just having your approvals. You need uptake, you need clinical data, you need to demonstrate that you've got a pathway to reimbursement, even if you haven't quite got it yet. You know, you need to show this is where you're headed. Um, you know, gone are the days where you could uh, pitch up with something drawn on the back of a flag packet and ask for a couple of mil. But um, unfortunately, uh, it appears to, have, uh, appears to have gone wrong behind us. Great. And then, so in terms of sort of user needs or design focus, I mean, when you're speaking to those KOLs, Claire, or um, the rest of you out there sort of on the field, what, what, is, what are people asking for? Like, what kind of has changed in terms of how people want to be using products um, in the clinical out space? Are there any sort of particular themes or trends that you've, that you've noticed from the KOLs? Well, I mean, Charles made a really, really good point that there is a massive difference between KOLs and, and, and your general practitioners and, and their needs and wants are going to be very different as well, which is why, yeah, as I said earlier, we, we start with the, with the, the, the kind of the academics and we, and we work, we work through the, the sites to, to get to the general practitioners. 
uh, regards you know needs and wants i mean it, it, it's going to be different um depending in, in which indication you're working in obviously and what your areas but i mean i think something that's common across everything is that people now need to see you know more return to value you know um eat the hospitals are, are more aware of, of the of the economic impacts of the devices and the procedures at least that's certainly what i've found i mean steve is that is that true in your experience i mean absolutely one of the things that uh that I worry about is smaller companies struggling early on and actually coming up with a product. What with the MDR coming up and the, the push towards reimbursement, clinical outcome, RCTs needed here and there, smaller companies are finding it very, very hard to actually first survive, get all the all the documentation correctly done define the products early on, look at, at their potential kind of uh, efficacy of the product coming up for an unmet need. So I worry that these smaller companies struggle early on and, and, and there is the tilt to buy towards the larger companies that can afford all of those people and all this work. I'd like to, to, to think and I'd like to say that smaller companies can get it done if they put a multidisciplinary team, get the right talent, get the right advisors, great boards make great companies, have board of directors that make a lot of sense, work with engineering, work with the clinical, the doctors, the key opinion leader, not the big, big shots, but across the board, I would say, at the end, you will make it and you will make a difference. And uh, I work with companies that, that actually managed to get uh, their act together. And these companies were acquired by Stryker and Globus and so on, which are the large uh, medtech companies. So I, I think you got to do it in a structured way. Listen to Chaz and Claire and Frederick and just make sure that you follow a process. Will it take time? Yes. Is it going to take a lot of funding? Absolutely. Will you stay awake most nights? Hundred percent. I'm sure. You know? So, uh, will but you know there is a return at the end of the day. You know, and uh, at the end, you know, you're helping patients. You bring them to full health. So there is there is a payoff at the end of the day, beside the reward uh, monetary piece. Um, so I, I I would say I would. Say, Say that the smaller companies should not give up and say, oh, MDR, oh, FDA, health economics, you know, uh, clinical evidence based medicine. I need to do a random controlled trial. I mean, uh, yes, you, you need to do all of that, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Great. And so you mentioned MDR, obviously we have, we have to discuss that. And how, how is that now <laughs> changing? the way companies are thinking about design and, and, and how, how do you see it impacting the industry moving forward? I got the perfect person to answer it, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so, well, Steve had a really good point, right? It, it looks daunting. When you look at what you've got to do, you know, there's all this documentation, there's, you know, there's all, everything from, it's, it's, it's doable. It's all really doable. You get good teams around you. You get good advisors. You know, don't, you don't try and hire in all your expertise, expertise, you know, go and get it as you need it, you know, uh, and it, it's, it's doable. You keep your head straight and you keep going. Um, I would say the, the biggest change, the biggest change from MDD to MDR is the clinical, the need for clinical, more clinical evidence before your CE mark is awarded. Now, under the MDD, you have always needed this, right? This isn't something new. Um, and over recent years, you know, it has been it has been increasing. But under the MDR, it's very clear that you will not be getting CE mark um, as easily without the level of clinical evidence that you did before. Now, as a small company, clinical trials are expensive. And I think the, the problem is it, for, for small companies and, and the need for you know, and, and getting to the trials, it, it's not necessarily that they are difficult. I mean, they are difficult, but everything's difficult, but that can be overcome, you know? Hard work, get people to know who they're doing, keep your head straight. You, you can get through the, 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 you know, the practicalities. 
But the problem is, is that clinical trials, they go on for a long time and you have to generate news to keep your investors interested. You know, during the design process, you're hitting this milestone, you're hitting that milestone, you've got news flow, you can keep people interested, you can, you know, you can, you know, you've got small valuation hikes as you go. When you are in trials, you are sitting there and you don't have a lot of news to give people, your investors, the market in general, you've got to keep people interested and you've got to keep them funding you. Because unless you do a big fundraise before you go into your trial, you're going to need more halfway through. And they're always more expensive than you think, and they always overrun. I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but this, <laughs> but this, this is our experience. So for me, I think um, interim, interim reporting in trials, it ups your group size and it makes it longer, but it keeps people interested. It lets, gives you something to shout about. And run your IISs next to them. Uh, because again, that gives you publications, that gives you things to do. As a small company, we constantly need to be fundraising, we constantly need to be creating noise and excitement. And if, you, if you're if you a big company and you have the luxury of kind of just going quiet with your trial until you get to the end and coming out with a bang, that is amazing. Small companies, you don't have that. So when you're designing, make sure that there are, that you have news flow, that you have points at which you can, you can go to your shareholders, you can go to the market, you can let them know what you're up to. Otherwise, it's, I think, is it, am I right? They call it the valley of death for, for medical devices. Um, so, and obviously, nobody wants to be there. Um, I, that's, that's, that's what I would say. I mean, Chaz, uh, what do you think? Yeah, so I'm, I'm afraid that we're drifting a little bit off the um, <laughs> kind of topic of design because, um, but this is all, you know, it is all terribly relevant to the journey, right? Because it is a journey, it's not, not a destination. I think, I mean, the, the, just going back to the design thing, I was just thinking about um, the kind of formalization of the process. And of course, there are many books published on, you know, how to design the perfect product and stuff. But there's a couple of resources that. Oh, no. Hello. It's frozen. Hello. Chaz, yeah. I think. He'll come back. My we might have to start that bit again. <laughs> <laughs> it's true though, I think we, we have kind of drifted away from design, uh, but it's all good. On the MDR, right, on the caffeine and question on the MDR there for, for us in the dental industry, right? We, of course, it's a lot of uh, work in initially, right, and in getting into the new processes and so on and the documentation. But the uh, dental industry hasn't been so regulated before, and we've seen a lot of competitors coming up or small companies, and not all of them serious, right? But you're not benefiting the patients always, right? So, so having a, a, a bit stricter will weed out some of those companies that have not been you know, having a serious business before, and it's going to be the ones that are in it uh, and, and being serious that will benefit from this one. That's true. And, and you know, it's not all bad. So having to have the clinical evidence to get the to get the approvals just put you that one step closer to, to, to reimbursement. You know, you've got some health economic data. If you've planned your if you've planned your trials, you've collected some. It's not enough, but it's a step in the right direction. It might get you some pass-through um, reimbursement, it might get you some sort of you know early stage temporary. So it's it, it's not all bad. Um it, it can be an advantage, it means that you, you you're not it used to be that you get your CE mark and then you have to start your trials. So the, the CE mark really didn't mean an awful lot. Um, I mean, some companies uh, did that way. But I think forcing companies to have clinical evidence before they get approvals to go on the market will make sure, it will kind of almost force small companies to look at the wider um, wider requirements for, for health economic data and, and reimbursement that it could lead to. Um, it, it, it is just finding the, the funding and, and as Steve said, you know, the sleepless nights uh, to, to get yourself there. It's, um, I don't see any end to those in the immediate future. Yeah. I mean, before Chas comes online, I just want to add the design phase. I think the most crucial elements in a, for a product and the design phase, you've got to spend a lot of time on this. And because you're trying to foresee what's going to happen in the next couple of years. And what do you need to do in terms of application of the product, the unmet need, the priority of the outcome, and so on. So you've got you to gotta really work the design phase if you need to involve consultants, if you need to involve, you know, there's so many books on this, KOLs to help you out, identify whether you're on the right kind of uh, indication to do 
a huge value add in terms of innovation or not. You don't want to design a medical device that just tweaks the product for you to get a 510K very fast or CEMR because there's so many lookalike products in the marketplace. Then the return is not going to be there. You will get approval. Bravo. You have it. Well done. Now go and sell the product, you know. So uh, that would be the, the biggest challenge if people buy the product or not. So I think, you know, when Chaz comes back, he can actually elaborate on this one. I feel that this is so crucial and small companies would need help, would need help from maybe board members, maybe consultants and so on, so that they can get coached to be able not to speed up the process and run. Let me, let me get the, the concept. Let me do the design, validate, and then I'm going to do the proof of concept and start clinical. You, you gotta, you gotta do your homework. And if it takes time and money, so be it. It will save you a lot of money in the long run. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't, and yeah. Can I just say, you sound a lot like my chairman just said. We've got, we've got approvals. Great. Now go sell it. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's talk a bit about how um, the design process has changed over the past 10, 20 years. And maybe looking forward again, like, um, ha again, how it might continue to evolve. Um, over to you, Kaz. Okay, so I'm not sure that the design process has changed. I think that the external environment's changed and that the design has to incorporate different aspects. Um, yep. You know, you've talked about the MDR um, and FDA, of course, um, and those regulations have changed and become, become more difficult and put the onus upon no larger clinical studies, um, et cetera. So I, I think that the, I don't think the design process has changed so much. I think the environment's changed. I, I don't know how much you, I got to with the kind of process of design in that previous discussion where I was cut off, but, um, you know, it's worth taking a look at the Stanford Biodesign and the NUIG Bioinnovate programs because they have a very formalized design process that they, they use as part of the educational program in those two, um, and, in those, in those two programs. And you can actually just go on the web to either the Stanford Biodesign website or the NUIG Bioinnovate program um, based out of Galway. And they have this whole process of market, um, uh, market understanding, definition, the innovation process, and then the iteration process leading to the um, design of a successful product. So I'm not sure that the design's changed really in terms of you know, understanding customer needs, understanding um, your design envelope and then um, designing the, the, the trials that are going to prove that your design works. I just think that the environment's changed, making the um, design process more difficult at uh, certain aspects of the product development. Jess, would you say that the traditional medtech design, right, that has been very, you know, is, is really geared to, a, you know, meeting a functional need, right, and a quite engineer driven, and has it changed over the last years to be a bit more holistic, maybe not only the function, but um, of course the usability, but a more increased focus on just, just usability uh, of, of actually in the design process? Well, actually, Frederick, that's a great question because probably the biggest, in, you know, I, I mean, I always, when people ask me what I do, I say, well, basically we're plumbers, you know, I mean, the body is a selection of tubes and we find different ways of keeping them open for as long as possible. And that's, you know, simplistically what we do. But, you know, the biggest, biggest change now has been the whole AI piece and, you know, the use of massive computational power to, uh, one, help the design process. I mean, I remember when we designed our very first stent, it was very much trial and error. But now, of course, you'd be crazy if you just don't go and buy a commercial program that allows you to, you know, define each element of the stent and, you know, determine on how it's going to react under, uh, under um, you know, flexion and pressures and stuff. So... So I think that the external environment's changed to allow us a lot more tools of design. You know, I mean, you know, CAD CAM stuff is just, you know, everyday stuff now was, again, when I started my first company, that was a real privilege to have a piece of kit like that and was very, very expensive. So I think there's a lot of things in the environment that have changed, but the fundamental process of understanding what the product has to do um, is, is pretty intact. Yeah. I think the I think the risk assessment process, so yeah, risk-based design, right? So we we we've pretty much always done it that way. 
But what I've noticed over, over with the MDR coming in, the, the engineers are thinking about clinicals earlier and they're bringing them in to the risk management process. So the clinical trials have been designed to answer the, you know, the, the residual, some of the residual risks and mostly around usability. So I, I, I think, uh, I think it's a good thing. Um, and I think it was, I think it should have always been there, but I think it has been lacking just because you know, clinical and, and design have always been, in some, always been a little bit more separate than we're seeing them being these days. And, and I think the usability design risks normally need the clinical trials to answer them. So I think the risk management process widening out in, across, uh, across you know, just your straight kind of FMEA, widening out into usability and, and clinical, and that's had a really positive effect in, uh, in sort of you know, trial design and also in helping the different functions to understand what each other needs uh, and what each other brings to the party. Uh, I, I remember, you know, not that long ago, um, engineers, you know, your kind of hardware engineers used to, your product development sort of uh, usability guys used to come in and just get sort of like sneered and oh, you're going to do some colouring in, you know, that, that, that seems to have, that seems to have gone and, and for the better, I think. And I think that the, you know, the development of the quality systems and the ISO standards and FDA guidance documents and, you know, there's a lot more external sources you can go to to um to advise that that design process i mean you know fda publishes incredibly helpful guidance although of course they don't publish guidance on completely new innovative devices because they don't have any guidance for them and so you have to infer that from similar type devices and understand that S fda is likely to expect you know the following of course the, all of the iso testing standards which form part of everyone's quality systems nowadays um, also incredibly informative so i mean on the on the iso and some of the quality systems you could get consultants to help you out with it as well there's a lot of people with tons of knowledge that can help in the design process and you need these folks uh there's readily available on the web the fda uh so so i think the tools are out there and my, my recommendation is to bring this help early on when you're actually putting the team together to help you out. Okay. Yeah. You may need to pay for these consultants, so be it. At least you don't make mistakes, you know, down the road. So uh, is it available to help? Readily available. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we didn't talk a lot about the quality system, the ISO in the U.S. and so on. So, so all of this has to be done. Yeah. The, the testing and validation, the risk management piece, and so on, till you are able to get the FDA and then get into the market and start getting some revenue and income, then you have the big boy say, wow, you've got really nice technology now. Shall we have a discussion? So, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, Chad is right. The, the tools are out there. It's not like, you know, this thing, you need to, re to invent it. No. Yeah, and I think the biggest misunderstanding from engineering teams when they're looking at the quality standards is that they seem to think it's going to tell them what they have to do. They don't. Quality standards tell you how you have to do things. They tell you, you know, you must document this, you must demonstrate this. But they don't tell you exactly, you know, how to do that, you, you, what to do in order to demonstrate that. That's up to you. And a good consultant will come in and they'll show you the framework that you have to work within and they will capture your practices to make sure that your practices fit within the regulatory framework. Um, I've, I've, worked to, I've worked at companies before where they've gone and kind of bought a pack of uh, SOPs and, and put them in and said, that, that, that's our quality management system. It's, you, you cannot do that. You can't work under somebody else's SOP. You take the framework and you do your own design. You need a good consultant to help you and they are worth their weight in gold. Unless you are lucky enough to have someone in the company with that sort of quality management knowledge and experience. But trying to do it on the cheek, it's a false economy. You'll end up with a set of processes you can't follow and you can't pass an audit if you can't follow your processes. Absolutely. What are your thoughts, Roger? I was just thinking about so so uh, now we went into the QMS and, and the quality management systems, but but Steve, with your experience, right? Which which uh, competences do you need to have in house versus actually outsourcing and, and taking help of consultants when you're doing product design, right? Because 
uh, it's going to be a shortcut to, to hiring consultants, but really you need to have such a deep knowledge as well, right? That it might be worthwhile to actually build up more in-house competences. And I might know it's difficult for small companies uh, rather than outsourcing. What, what's your experience on that? Right. I mean, it's a great question that we discuss it almost in every board meeting. So uh, my, my experience in it is that the the skill set which is needed in the company where you have already an IP outline, you already have a, a proof of concept kind of all mapped out, then you could actually hire those quality uh, consultants to help you out with it, the regulatory pathway to help you kind of navigate. And as you start getting more traction with your proof of concept, then you need to get the people to be hired in-house. For a startup to come in and hire a reimbursement manager, a clinical VP, a consultant on the quality, uh, and so on, and, and head of engineering, any manufacturing, and I tell you, you will have no money to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thank you, everyone. I think we've just got some time now for some final thoughts and comments. Um, Steve, maybe we'll just go back to you. I know that you were um, giving some advice to some small, smaller companies. Did you have any other sort of recommendations for them um, as we conclude? I mean, uh, like Chess, I think the design phase is the most important and crucial phase in any company. You do not want to actually make mistakes in that uh, phase. And if you need to spend more time on it and more money, then do it. Okay. Now, over to you, Chess. Yep. So, I mean, I just adding to what Steve said, I mean, that's, of course, true. In fact, it, it's interesting, just reflecting on this discussion today, we've talked a lot about the product design, but of course, design includes a lot of other things, including the design of clinical studies, um, the design of testing, um, the design of everything that goes around proving the, the actual design of the product. But I think in closing, I was, you know, there's lots of external materials out there. Um, it's worth having a good search on the net. I particularly um, suggest people go look at the BioNovate program website. It's got a very kind of formalized um, process there. And um, yeah, I think um, it is the most important thing that you're going to do um, because it's going to, that's going to determine that the product that you end up with. Okay. And what about you, Frederick? No, I can only concur with you. <laughs> With Steve and Chester, right? I mean, the product design is, is crucial, right? And it's really taking your time, right? I mean, we talked about uh, understanding the unmet needs, but it also, as it will say, takes some time to develop. It's also to understand your, your, your target groups here uh, and uh, also consider, you know, on a patient level, what, the, what are the patients expecting? Because that's something we've learned over the years, right? Where we have you know, 1% of the uh, patients are being treated with dental implants that will actually be benefiting from having dental implants. So what are the barriers for, for, for the patients to go into this? And, and then one is patient fear. And how can we make patients feel more comfortable uh, during a treatment, right? Well, how can we change our protocols and support uh, our customers, the clinicians in delivering this, making sure that customers and patients in the end customers here are feeling more, more comfortable. So really understanding the, maybe a bit more holistic point of view on the product design than just more the function and engineering part and really the workflows, how it's going to be used and, and the needs there. Okay, thank you. And finally, Claire. Um, so I would say two things. Um, avoid tech push, right? So you might have the best technology in the world. If you don't get it right, no one will buy it, right? So take your time, understand how your technology can be used. And if it can't be, Leave it alone. Do not waste millions of pounds and years trying to build something no one will buy. And the other one is don't be scared. It looks like a lot, but just you know, keep focus. Focus on what you need to do to get where you need to be. Hire in help. It's all available. Get a good board, right? Get a good set of non-execs that can give you the advice you need. And just get on with it. Yeah, well done. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, um, it's been a pleasure and great to hear all the different perspectives um i'm sure everyone's learned a lot so thank you all for joining us and thank, thank you, you. Thank thank you. Over to angela thank you. well what a great session thank you for all of our panelists for providing so much 
food for thought and just generally so much energy and enthusiasm about this topic. Um, I encourage everyone who is watching to follow up with our panelists directly to have your questions answered. Just use the messaging tool on the swap card platform, please, to do so. So next up, we have a really inter interesting presentation from Huron starting at four o'clock British time. But in the meantime, thank you once again to our panel and to Catherine and goodbye.